Okay, so now we're finishing up with our pellet, and it's been sitting here for a couple minutes, and I have to now take the bolts out, obviously. Remember what you learned, maybe in physics, about lefty Lucy, right? Remember that? So I have to think about it. Lefty Lucy, I want to go this way. So I'm going to take this bolt out, and I put it in pretty tight, so I'm really suffering for this. Okay. Again, you can take out your aggression removing it as well. What I do is I get it loose, and then I lift it out a little bit, because this thing goes really deep, and it's hard to get it out. So I'm going to, like, unscrew this guy. Okay, got it out. All right, lay the bolt down, flip it over, put it back in. Now, this is the one you have to be super careful that you're doing lefty-loosey, because think about what happens if you go the wrong way. Okay, the compound is fused in the middle of this, this um, nut, okay? So I'm going to go lefty-loosey, get it loose enough. Now, this is the moment of truth, because I'm telling you, I have no idea how this thing's going to come out. Sometimes I make bad pellets, and I might have made a bad pellet. There are a lot of things that contribute to bad pellets. Here I am making excuses before I even look at it. But there are a lot of things that contribute to bad, bad pellets. One is the amount of KBR you use, the ratio between the KBR and the compound. And you notice I estimated my compound. I'm being really lame. I'm making a lot of excuses because I think I'm going to fail. So here we go. Let's see if we have luck here. All right, this, I lift it out a little bit so you can get it out. Now I'm taking it off, lefty Lucy. Oh boy, this could be a bad scene. Okay, let's take a look at it. It's not the greatest pellet, but it is a pellet. So what I'm seeing in the middle of my, um, uh, I keep the plastic wanting to call it a bolt, but it's a nut, is uh, an opaque solid that's covering the center. I made one yesterday and it came out beautifully. It was like as clear as a bell. The best pellets are transparent. This is an indication that I probably didn't put quite enough pressure on it and maybe I didn't wait long enough. Or maybe my ratios weren't right. But I think this will work. So let's go over and run it. Um, I'm going to run it on the other instrument so you can see the other instrument. This is the other one. It's exactly the same deal. Okay. We run open. I'm going to explain why in a minute. What I want to do is take my sample and put it up on these two prongs. So that nut becomes the sample holder as well as the sample maker. Okay. What do we have to do, though, before we run it? I'm going to take it off. We have to run a background, which you saw me do a million times. Okay, background. Take my glove off. Don't want to damage the instrument. Scan. Background. Execute. Which is number seven again. This machine's just waking up, so it's acting a little funny. Okay, I'm going to do it one more time. Scan, background, execute. I'm not suggesting you do backgrounds multiple times. All right. Okay. As I told you, the background memory immediately flips away. If you want to look at the background, hit the background button. All right. You tell me, is this a good background? Does this look like the background you saw in the last spectrum? Okay. It's a good background. Now I'm going to run my sample. I'm taking my sample. I'm going to put it up on the prongs. How do you run a sample? It's exactly the same deal. Scan, X, number seven, execute. It takes one to four seconds to run an IR. Okay. This is a spectrum. It's a very typical looking spectrum of a sample that probably wasn't pressed enough. You'll have a lot of samples like that. Maybe not, but you might. Okay, what do I want to do? I want it to fill the screen. So as you saw before, I can use this button, the up arrow, to bring it up a little bit. I can use this button with the two heads facing out, two arrows facing out, to make it bigger. You see how it's, it's actually not a bad spectrum. Okay. This is actually a pretty good spectrum. What you can see here is um, a big OH peak from the carboxylic acid, 
I've got a peak from the carbonyl, I've got a peak from the double bond. This compound's called transdynamic acid. I also see some evidence that it's an aromatic. You're going to learn all about the interpretation in class. But I like that spectrum. That isn't too bad. Um, I encourage you to play with these buttons, right? If I want to make it bigger horizontally, I use this button with the two arrows going out horizontally, right? That makes it bigger. This one makes it smaller. Don't do this. Don't use it like this. This is how people usually do it. Right? You can push the button continuously and get it the proper size to fit the screen. I can move it over a little bit that way. Okay? So that's about the way you want it to look when you print it. Okay? How do you print? Well, what you do is you hit... I'm sorry, I walked right in front of my head. You hit the button plot. Okay? But while my plotter warms up, I'm going to explain why we run the machine open. Perkin Elmer recommends that you run it open because you are a carbon dioxide water machine. You're producing carbon dioxide and water all the time, right? Respiration, CO2, water coming out of your mouth. If you were standing in front of the instrument and you were constantly opening and closing the door while you were doing backgrounds and running your spectrum, you would be breathing carbon dioxide and water into this cavity. And by opening and closing the door, you would be changing the concentration. And the instrument has to subtract the background spectrum from the real spectrum so that you don't see these peaks. This is perfect. I don't see any of those peaks, okay? So apparently, I didn't wildly change the carbon dioxide and water while I was running. So I always tell students not to be heavy breathers. Like, don't stand in front of the instrument breathing hard, okay? Finally, my uh, printer is warmed up, and this is the way it is every day when we first start. But the trick with these is that you don't hit print, uh, print, you hit plot, and that's very counterintuitive. It kind of goes against everything we've been doing. So you hit plot, and then the the spectrum will plot out over here on a piece of paper. I don't know if you can see that up on the screen, but it'll plot out on a piece of paper. Okay, how are we for time? Seven minutes. Okay, so we'll let that plot out. Um, while it's plotting out, um, we want to talk a little bit about cleaning up, okay? Cleaning up this kind of sample entails taking a spatula and poking the window out and then wiping it out really well with Kim wipes, okay? So if I wanted to clean this, okay, I would poke it out. It's just, a, it's just salt. It's not anything really dangerous, except your compound might be a little, but there's very little compound in there. Take it out, poke it out with a Kim wipe and then really wipe it out and I recommend taking a Kim wipe and really stuffing it in there and moving it around in the screws to clean the dust out so the next person doesn't get traces of your compound. It's also a good idea to wipe the bolts off. Everything should go back into this bell jar. A lot of people leave chemicals out all the time. When it comes to uh, well we'll finish up on our next film, but before we go, you can take a look at what a spectrum looks like on paper. So this is the spectrum, a pretty good spectrum of trans acid. Not perfect, but pretty good. Hopefully you'll get something like this.